Have you ever woken up in the middle of the night with the realization that you missed that ablative absolute in Latin class? Does the thought of the short answer translation segments make you shudder? Or do you not really know your partitive genitive from your date of evagent? And do the short answer questions kind of trip you up on the AP Latin exam? Well, this video might be for you as we look at maximizing points on that short answer question while also reviewing parts of Caesar's disastrous trip uh, to Britannia, as told in book four of his Gallic War. I am Ben Johnson, and I am going to be reviewing this with you here. I teach Latin at Hamden Academy in Hamden, Maine, and I am joined by my partner in this trip through Caesar Review, uh, Jenny Luongo. Jenny, welcome. Salve. Salve, salve te uomnes. Uh, my name is Jenny Luongo. I teach Latin at St. Andrew's Episcopal School in Austin, Texas, and thrilled to be here with you all again today. So quid hodie discamus. What will we learn? Well, um, today, as Ben mentioned, we're going to be um, reviewing um, Caesar's De Bello Gallico book four. We have to read uh, paragraphs 24 through 35, plus the first sentence of uh, paragraph 36 um, for the syllabus. Um, and in it, we learn all about how um, Caesar invades Britannia. Um, I think he tries to kind of salvage the narrative and make us maybe feel like he's more successful than maybe he was. Um, it was a challenge. Um, to travel to Britannia for sure. We're also going to be today focusing on the short answer sections, talking about um, the types of reading comprehension um, and translation questions that you might encounter, um, plus reviewing some grammatical terminology to go along with that. So that'll be fun. Oh, looks like we <gasps> have someone here. Uh, we're seeing Geterix Sum. I guess this is this is Vercingetorix. Oh, how exciting. We're joined today by Werken Gederix. Um, you know, I, I don't know that he ever went to Britannia since he um, was a member of that Arwerni tribe that we were talking about um, yesterday, but uh, it's nice to have the Gallic perspective come along with us today. Right. Exactly. That'll be good. Uh, so uh, we often like to start these off with a nice review of the uh, bits of the Latin and here. So our quid ocket is what happened uh, slide for book four. Uh, we aren't doing any English reading today. So that's going to be a, a nice relief from a lot of these reviews that we'll have some time spent on, on the English reading that you'll be expected to know for the AP exam. So in just these, these uh, 12, 13 chapters here, um, we get uh, us the Romans struggling to um, win the battle in, um, in Britannia. And it's actually an amphibious assault where Caesar's um, forces have to uh, jump off of ships and wade through water and fight British that are lined up um, in, uh, in a very uh, defensible position. Um, and yet the Romans still are able to gain that, that foothold in Britannia and um, make their way onto land where they finally can set up camp um, before they realize that, well, there's a, a shortage of grain and supplies because some of his ships don't make it there and get blown off course. Um, and he, Caesar doesn't have his cavalry and all of these, these issues that maybe um, suggest to us that Caesar maybe didn't plan this invasion very well. So because of this shortage of grain and supplies and the small number of, of Roman troops, um, the British forces surprise the Romans and uh, almost deal them a defeat. Um, the thought that that maybe they could um, throw the Romans out of Britannia and free themselves for forever um, from the threat of, of Roman occupation, which if you know your Roman history, um, even though Caesar isn't able to maintain a foothold for the Romans in Britannia, eventually, uh, over 100 years later, the Romans do make their way back there uh, and set up um, an occupation that lasts for several hundreds of years. Uh, and then uh, also in these, these, these chapters, we get the a rather famous discussion of how British chariots fight in war, which um, for Caesar and his audience is one of those things of uh, the description of something that would be considered to be foreign and possibly interesting to uh, the Romans um, back in Rome who would be reading this. So uh, we're also going to talk about the short answer section in this video. And just to let you know about what the short answer section is, um, on the free response section, there are five questions, and two of those questions are 
or we'll call them short answer questions. One's going to be from the Virgil syllabus. So something that if you've covered the entire AP syllabus, uh, especially the Virgil units, um, you will have seen this Latin before. And then the other question is from the Caesar syllabus passages. So again, something that if you have covered the whole syllabus, you will have seen before, which is good. It's nice going in knowing that, well, if I think hard enough about this passage, I hopefully will remember doing it at home or doing it in class. And that little bit of context can, can help you out when answering the questions. Taken together, the sections is 15% of the exam, so weighted in the exact same amount as the translation um, questions that we talked about in yesterday's yesterday's review video. And uh, the passages are a bit longer than the translations, though. So this could be, um, if we're talking about the poetry, um, maybe somewhere from Jenny, you think like seven lines to ten lines, and yeah, and maybe that seems like about right, 60, 70 words or so forth for Caesar something along those lines. Yeah, um, that sounds right. So they tend not to be glosses. Those are defined words. You'll see the glosses on the translations, but for this, you're gonna to have to rely on your knowledge of the Latin and maybe what you can figure out from the context of the passage. Some questions have two parts, A and B, and it's gonna be noted as an A and a B. And these questions are worth two points. So you have to make sure that you answer both of those questions um, because if you only answer one of the question, uh, then you can only get one of those points. So just pay attention to that. Answer the questions that you're asked. And then just to remind you, there are no half points. So if the question is asking, for instance, for like a, um, I don't know, a case and a number, and if you only answer for the case, um, then you will get zero points because you forgot to identify whether it was singular or plural. So um, just make sure that you answer all parts of the question and all of the questions. Well, and the good news, right, then on those A, B questions is um, they can get credit for the A part and not the B part or right. vice versa. Right. So you'll see those labeled clearly and just know that's what it's telling you. Um, some tips. You should still try to answer every single question. There is no penalty for guessing. The people who are reading and scoring your exam are not going to know who you are. There's no um, danger of being embarrassed, that sort of thing. So write down what you know. Don't leave questions blank. If you um, don't know exactly what they're asking for, then write something that you do know about that word, because very often that's the right answer. Yeah, if, if it's um, like, if it asks you for like a mood or a voice, you don't know what your options are, but you know that, well, I know when my teacher asked me this question, this about this word, like the, for instance, like a, a pluperfect subjunctive has an ISSE in it. I see that ISSE. I'm just going to write down pluperfect subjunctive. I don't know what mood is, but it asks for what I know. And that's the obvious thing. The question tends to ask, like, what's the obvious thing about this? Participles. What tense is this participle? I don't know the tenses of the participles, but I know this is a present participle. So I'll just write that. Right, exactly. You write what you know, um, you know, don't leave it blank is the main thing that we want you to remember about this. If you can, the best thing you can do is to mentally turn these questions into a multiple choice. So if it asks you about the case of a word, know what your seven case options are in Latin, nominative, genitive, dative, accusative, ablative, locative, vocative, um, so that you can think through those options. If it asks for a mood, know that the moods are going to be indicative, imperative, and subjunctive. Um, so make yourself lists of things like that. Um, we're going to be going through some of the characteristic um, questions they ask. Make yourself lists today if you don't know the grammatical terminology um, or go through later and make yourself lists about kind of what the options are if they ask you the use of the ablative. Um, there are lots of helpful um, places you can look for those kinds of things. There are the videos in AP Classroom, many of which cover grammatical concepts. Um, there are great things online like the Latin Tutorial YouTube channel. I feel like you may have something to do with that. Um, a then, great resource, great resource. Great I resource recommend if, that. if you're looking for uses of the ablative or the dative or the genitive. 
remember that a brief answer is absolutely fine. Um, if they ask you, um, for instance, um, what goddess um, induced Aeolus to start the storm in book one of the Aeneid to kind of switch works, even though we're having a day Bello Gallico day, um, just write Juno. I've definitely seen students lose points on these questions that should be relatively straightforward by thinking they needed to write a paragraph and by having incorrect information in that paragraph. Um, once your, your answer has some incorrect information, it, it tends to spoil your answer. So if they're asking you for a one word answer, just give us that one word. These are not paragraph answers. Um, You'll want to focus on how to identify common constructions like ablatives and gerundives. Um, we talk so much about this in all of our videos, but um, things like the ablative absolute, um, because it's used so much in Latin, it's going to be somewhere on the AP exam. Um, I tell my students that if you don't see an ablative absolute somewhere, something's wrong. Um, so or, make or sure you got it wrong. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh. So make sure that you know how to recognize those two word ablative phrases with two nouns paired together or a noun and a participle paired together. Um, make sure that you know how to recognize gerundives, those words that have an ND before the ending, um, like delenda, for instance, and then make sure you know what gerundives can do. So if it's delenda est, you're going to translate it must be. If it's odd delendum, it's going to be to destroy. If it's delendi causa or gratia, it's going to be for the sake of destroying. So, so make sure you recognize those common things that get asked about and that you know what to do with them in terms of translation. Um, these questions, I think, are some of the most doable. So yesterday we were talking about how the, the literal translation questions are worth 15% of the exam um, and that we would be happy with our students if they um, scored about half of those correct, those segments correct. Today, um, I want to just say you can do these questions, attempt them all, answer them. Um, students tend to be able to maximize their points here, and these are equivalent in value to those challenging literal translations. So, um, you know, you all are going to do great on this section, and we're excited to work you through some examples. So, some types that we're going to encounter today. Um, you're going to see a lot of reading comprehension questions where they ask you to look at a section and answer a question about what's happening. So focus on knowing what happens in book four today, but on other days, um, you know, whatever syllabus passages might arise. Um, focus on learning your grammatical terms and being able to translate those common things like ablative absolutes that we talked about because you're uh, very often gonna see grammatical terminology and translation questions here, sometimes paired together in that A, B format. So be ready for that. Um, and then you're also gonna have some short answer questions that are just gonna test you over the English readings that we're reviewing or over your Roman cultural and historical knowledge. And on those questions, that advice we gave you about just write what you know, um, that's great advice for these questions too. Um, you may not remember exactly um, what Egyptian queen is being referred to, but you know Cleopatra is an Egyptian queen. And so that's probably the one. Um, so, you know, just make a guess um, and answer the thing that you know. Yeah, our um, our guest for today, Versen Jedrix, um, is a uh, is a great example because he's featured in the English reading for Book Seven. So, if they ask you what Gallic chieftain or leader um, defeated the Romans at such and such town, and you're like, I don't remember that battle. Like, I don't remember all of the Gallic leaders against Caesar then. So, I just am not going to answer this. Um, but if you think about it and you think, well, well, who do they really want me to know about book seven? And well, Vercingetorix is really the key figure there in leading the Gallic resistance against the Romans. So I should probably put his name down. I might not know specific things, um, but I know generally, and that's really the whole point of this, this cultural historical knowledge piece or this English reading comprehension. It's to get at those big picture items. So if you have an idea of those big picture items, don't know if the specifics are exactly correct, 
go with what you know and put in that guess there. So, and and just to make sure Jenny, everyone's aware, we have a, a super secret special question type that's only used on poetry short answers, right? Yeah, so we'll be talking about that next week when we get into the Aeneid, Virgil's Aeneid, and we start talking about scansion, which is so oh, fun. I'm excited. Fun. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Okay, so right. we're going to look at some examples here, Spectamus exempla, uh, and this is going to be um, an example of a short answer question, and um, we have a passage here from book four of the Gallic War. Uh, this is after the uh, the Roman invasion, Peace is Made in Britannia is the title. It's always good to look at that title as a way to uh, gain um, some context for what's going on here. And uh, also, just so you know, the short answer questions will have the citation of where it occurs down at the bottom below this. So if um, if it's for the, the Gallic War, it'll tell you the book number, book four here in this case, and also the chapter number, so chapter 28. So if you know generally what's going on in the different books, and if you know um, where in the book certain things happen, like the early part of book four is when the Romans were invading, and then later in the middle part of the book four stuff, we have the issues um, that we're going to see here. Um, and then at the end, we have um, the description of the chariot fighting and also um, the, the um, surprise attack that the British make on the Romans. Then that will help you get a lot of decent context. So with this, we have pieces made. So it's supposed to be after the, um, after the invasion has been successful for the Romans. And there's, well, I know at this time there's going to be some issues going on here. So, so all of that stuff will give you great context for helping um, answer questions about this. So, and, oh, it looks like, looks like Vercingetorix is here and he has some great advice, Jenny. Ne credite Romanis. Yeah, don't, don't trust the Romans. Yeah. Boy, is he right. <laughs> <laughs> at least from the British and Gallic perspective, right? Right, right, right. So, okay, so uh, we're going to split this up into talking about the different question types that Jenny talked about earlier, and give you some examples here of the um, of the types that you might see on the exam. So, this is going to be the reading comprehension, and uh, so we begin with when did the ships carry the cav carrying the cavalry set out from the continent. Um, and the second question is what happened when the fleet near the shore and then B quote the Latin that tells you this. So this is one of those A, B questions that if this were on an AP exam would be worth two points. So you could get A right and then have the wrong Latin. Um, so, and then uh, for three, give one and only one result of this event. And that's the type of question that you will see where it asks for, and it's very explicit, often bolded here, we've underlined it. Um, where it says give one and only one result. So you probably shouldn't give two, probably shouldn't give three. And I think one of the, the things to keep in mind with a question like this one and only one is that there are multiple possibilities here. So um, you can look for something and, and you could uh, give one answer and maybe one of your friends can give another answer and you're talking after the AP test and you have different answers for this and you both could get it right. So just something to keep in mind. So uh, I think Vercingetorix is going to help us here um, with this. So let's see. So for number one, when did the ships carrying the cavalry set out from the continent? Uh, you want to look at the Latin that I've um, put in blue over here on the left and underlined. And uh, I think Vercingetorix He's, he's fluent in English too. So he's going to tell us that this is on the fourth day after they came to Britannia. Um, and uh, that's possibly how you could answer this. You could even just answer like the fourth day probably would be good enough. Yeah, I think because, so. Yeah, that shows that answers the question and shows an understanding of the Latin. So let's see on the second question here, what happened when the fleet neared the shore? So you could look at this uh, this Latin over here. This is actually the, the Latin that I've underlined is B. Okay, so that's what you would quote, possibly tanta tempestas subito cortast. And so what does that mean? Well, Vercingetorix will tell us that a, a storm arose, a huge storm. But you could also just write, there was a storm. And then for number three, give one and only one result of this. So um, here is this nice result clause. I think that word result from the, the question maybe clues you in on where to look for the answer. Um, but there are multiple answers here. So this first bit, this first ut clause here is they couldn't hold their course. That is a result of the storm. 
it maybe isn't the entire result, but that answers the question. So you could put that down and get it correct. Uh, we have the, another one here that is another possible answer here, um, this Aliai to Referentur. So you could say that um, some of the ships returned to the continent. That was a result of the storm. That works. It's not the first result, but it's still an acceptable answer. And then we have this other one that is also a possibility. Yeah, there are lots of possible answers here. And some ships kept going west down to this, uh, the, where the setting of the sun happens, the lower part of the island. And uh, I think we can move on to some grammatical terms, Jenny, then. Yeah. Um, and, you know, this this is a place that you um, can really learn the options for case and use, for subjunctive, for ablative usage, and hopefully turn these into um, a multiple choice question for yourself mentally. Um, so uh, we're going to look first um, at this kind of um, case and use question. That's a very common thing for them to ask. Um, also common to ask about subjunctive uses. We've got a couple of those questions here. And then we've got three ablative uses, um, but keep in mind, uh, you know, while the ablative is very common and it's certainly going to be um, tested on the AP exam, um, you'll also wanna make sure that you know the uses of the dative and the genitive, and even knowing things like that, um, the nominative use of the subject and the accusative as the direct object, those could come up on the exam too. Sometimes my students worry that those questions would be too easy. Um, but let's go ahead and start taking a look at these specific questions. Um, so our first one is what case and use are pake confirmata, um, which we have highlighted in blue on that first line for you all. Um, so um, again, we those that um, noun plus participle pattern should set off bells that say, just like Vercingetorix is saying, ablative absolute in your mind, with peace having been strengthened or confirmed or something like that. Um, so make sure you are good at recognizing the ablative absolutes. They're all over the place. Let's take a look at this next question. We want the subjunctive use of apropinquarent. And usually for subjunctives, what you need to do is look around at the context and see what word is introducing that subjunctive clause. So here we've got quae cum apropinquarent. And as soon as we see the cum right before that subjunctive, then we should answer Let's see if Vercingetorix knows. I know. Oh, Vercingetorix got it. It's a cum clause. Yeah. Pretty good with his Latin grammar, I think. He, I'm, I mean, I'm impressed. I'm impressed. Comes from um, studying those Roman tactics. Yeah, he's bit. been, yeah. you know, working on that. And uh, he's probably made it into, into a multiple choice question for himself, too. Yeah, probably. Um, okay, so we're going to look at another subjunctive use here. Um, so as I look at this posset, I see ut nulla aarum cursum tenere posset. So I see the ut, um, which is really important. Um, and if I see an ut, then I'm going to give myself a multiple choice of either purpose, result, or a clause after a verb of fearing, which means I need to go even further back in the sentence to determine which of my multiple choices is right. In, in and direct I, command too. Oh, you don't want to yeah. forget that one. We don't. We don't. Especially I always Caesar, think of that right? yeah. as a kind of purpose clause. But you're oh. absolutely right that indirect command can be labeled as a separate thing. Um, so thank you for that reminder. Um, all right. So I, when I go back, I see that phrase that we just talked about, tanta tempestas, subito coorta s. Such a great storm suddenly arose. Tanta, I teach my students, is a word that gets results. Tanta, talus, seek, adeo, tom, talus. Did I leave one out? Um, uh, those tots. are taught. Thank you. Ita, that's exactly Ita, it. Ita. Um, Ita. That's a great one too. Those are all words that are going to introduce a result clause. Such a great thing happened that. Oh, versus and, and I agree. Good for him. Yeah. It must be right. Must be right. He knows, he knows his intensifying words. Yeah. He's got it. He's got it. Okay. So now we're moving on to uses of the ablative. Um, and so we have magno suo cum periculo. Um, and one thing I know in terms of making this a multiple choice question is that cum, when it's 
patterning with the ablative is really used only in accompaniment and manner. Um, so this doesn't look like accompaniment to me because it's with danger. So let's see what verse and has to say. Yeah. Okay. So right. can you go to the movies with danger? Uh, no, I mean, no? okay. Not unless you have a friend named danger, but okay. Um, that's true. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, that's going to be an ablative of manner with that coom. Okay. Let's see if Vercingetorix and I can do this next one. What use of the ablative is fluctibus. And so here, it has a cum right before it, but I think that's a cum clause, that cum complorentor. I don't think it's patterning with the fluctibus. I think we would have asked the question, like this is, put them together in the question. Yeah, this is this is super um, uh, tricky here because of that cum, right? Yeah, for sure. But I think they were filled um, by means of waves. And um, I tell my students, partly because I learned this from you, Ben, that the English words I use to translate the ablative word are going to be a big clue for me. So let's see what Vercingetorix says, but I think that by means of waves is my there clue. We go. Yeah, it's yeah. an ablative of means. And, and one of the things that I tell my own students is that if you, it, I mean, I, I know this, it's kind of great advice. Like if you know the translation, um, then everything's good. Um, and then it's like, well, I don't know the translation. So where do I start? But if you if you know what's going on here, and I do tell my students this, because Latin, especially if you've been taught how to read Latin, um, then often the reading is a little bit easier than that technical grammar stuff, then work from what you know, and work backwards from the reading. And we'll use the words that you've that you've put in there to make sense of this ablative as a way of, of helping you out. If it's from, then that's separation. If it's by means of, if that works, then yeah, that that's means. If it's in, that might be location. Um, and uh, yeah, if it's or time when. with respect to, that would be an ablative of specification or respect. So yeah. Yeah, I think great that's advice, a super, great advice. I'm super glad I gave it way. to you. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Thank you. Made me a better teacher. Um, okay, so the next one, what use of the ablative is adversa nocte? Um, so uh, we'll see what Vercingetorix is thinking in just a minute. But whenever I see a word like nocte or anno or hora or da in the ablative, I start thinking that it has something to do with time when or time within which. Um, and then I think it, it says um, they sought continentum, the continent referring to um, like Gaul, continental Europe um, in the adverse night because it's it's hard to sail at night. So I'm going to say um, like an ablative of time when, but let's see what verse in Jedrix has got for us. It goes with time when, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, so hopefully that gives students a good idea of the types of grammatical term questions that they're going to have. I think maybe we're moving on to a new type now, right? Yeah, let's do some translation stuff. So there almost always will be a translation question or two on that short answer. And these are going to be short segments. Um, probably maybe even shorter than some of the segments that you might see um, when you look at the translation um, and the scoring guidelines afterwards, um, they'll almost always be like one, but probably two words, probably at most three words. Um, and so here we have some common constructions, right? And that's the whole point about the translation. And they're not just going to make something that's that's really difficult that you've never seen before. That's the hardest bit of Latin in that section, but something that you probably should be able to do if you've been reading Caesar for a whole year, uh, reading Virgil for a whole year. So, um, so we have these three questions. Um, that first one, you know, you could maybe remember from um, the grammar questions that Jenny went over, translate pake confirmata. And um, we've got two words here. They are in an ablative absolute because we have that noun and that participle. So you could go with uh, first in Jetterix is with peace confirmed. Um, you could also probably translate this in a lot of different ways, like after peace had been made. Um, would also be acceptable because ablative absolutes don't always have to be translated according to that that handy formula that you often learn that you never really use in English when you're speaking it. So um, lots of possibilities here. You don't have to go with a specific vocabulary too, as long as it's correct, and uh, and then you'll be good. So uh, here we also have this cum clause. Um, we have cum plus its subjunctive verb translate cum apropinquarent, and so you would translate this as 
when they were approaching, as Vercingetorix says. So um, could you go with since they were approaching? Yeah, probably. Yeah, I think so. Even though, even though it when makes more sense here, right? Um, because it's probably showing um, the circumstance that happened and so forth. Um, the AP test isn't going to differentiate between like, well, we think that this is a better translation. And so therefore your sense is not going to be correct. It's acceptable because it could be, it could be. And we're not going to get into arguments around like which is better and which isn't better. And then finally, we have this, this very Caesarian and Virgilian in Altum phrase. So um, this actually probably is a fantastic question because if you've read the Aeneid and you've read Caesar, um, you should know that Altum means the deep. So let's see about first in Jeterix. He says, into the deep sea. Yeah. And we have this in plus the accusative um, showing motion towards, so into. And uh, you could just say into the deep, as he puts in his in his speech bubble, C in parentheses. I, you probably could have heard the parentheses when he spoke it, so. Probably so, probably yes. so. Okay, let's do some English reading culture All right. questions. So um, on these questions, uh, I think you're just going to have to um, trust yourself that you've spent a lot of time in Latin class, you've listened to your teacher, you've paid attention. Um, if these really worry you, um, I want to, you know, refer you to the English reading videos that are on AP Classroom. Um, if you're worried about um, things like Roman history, um, they're, uh, uh, a teacher named uh, Michael Weiner makes great Roman history videos. He's got a YouTube channel. Um, so check him out. Um, and then if you um, look at old national Latin exams, those culture questions that are there are great practice as well. So those are some places you can go if you're worried about this section. Um, and we'll try to make sure that in our resource folder, we have links to all of these resources for students. Um, so let's take a look at the kinds of things that you might be asked. Um, our first question is, who was emperor when the conquest of Britain was completed? Ben referenced the fact that Julius Caesar, A, was never what we would call emperor, uh, but B, he did not complete the conquest. Instead, um, you might have talked about in your class that this was the emperor Claudius says Vercingetorix, and he is right. It was just um, strange because Vercingetorix wasn't alive when that happened, but. You know, but he's here as our, um, you know, third host. So clearly yeah. he has a, a cartoon life um, that lives on. And maybe he traveled down into the underworld with Aeneas and uh, saw, saw the future Romans. Yeah. Yeah. Wouldn't that be great if there was an epic with Vercingetorix uh, as the uh, epic hero that we could read? Uh, maybe it's somewhere. I don't know if his uh, name scans in hexameter, though. That uh, might be tough to probably write. Probably the biggest problem. Um, okay. So in book one of De Bello Gallico. So now we have to think back to yesterday. We reviewed book one. Um, what area does Caesar cross into to meet with Aria Vistas? So we talked about um, how um, Caesar crosses a big river. Um, let's see what verse, I'm sure Vercingetorix is aware that he goes into German territory. Yeah, so uh, modern day Germany, Germania, German territory, any of those answers would be fine. And then number three, um, here, even though it's a De Bello Gallico reading, we might get a question about our English readings in the Aeneid. It happens sometimes. So after Aeneas's shipwreck in book one of the Aeneid, who appears to help orient him and understand Dido's background? And so, this, this question relates to the reading because there's a bit about ships in here, yeah, and shipwreck. So there's it, a shipwreck. So, so all of those things will probably like tie into the stuff that's going on. So you could use maybe even the question that is asked about culture or an English reading um, to help you kind of navigate like, oh, there's there's something about ships in here, storms, you know, things like that, so. Yeah, absolutely. And so here um, she comes disguised as a Spartan huntress in the woods of Libya, uh, makes total sense. Um, but this is Aeneas's mom, Venus, who often appears in the Aeneid to um, help her son out. So um, all you need to write on that question is Venus. You don't need to tell a story. You don't need to connect it to anything else. Just write Venus. Yeah, answer the question. Exactly. Okay. So nunc tempus est. Um, er, exercere. We're going to practice. Exerce amus. Let's do it. Um, so, okay. So we're going to do uh, 
just like yesterday, we had two translation practices. So we have two short answer practices um, of uh, seven-ish questions, which is about how many questions, maybe six or seven that you'll see on the, um, on the AP exam. And uh, so this is a time where you might want to pause the video. Let's get the little pause thing coming up there. Uh, it's a little transparent so that you'll be able to still see the Latin and also the questions, um, but pause your video actually pause your video, okay? I know that the answers are gonna be coming up soon, but this practice is probably really good to, to see if you can figure this stuff out. You wanna spend about 10 minutes or so, um, maybe a little bit longer, um, seeing if you can come up with the answer to all seven of these questions. We will still be here when you get back. Practice is always good, um, can go a long way. So um, after you've paused your video, then unpause it and then check your answers to see how you do. And, uh, and then you can have a second attack at this uh, short answer in the, in the next one. So um, I'm just gonna pause for a little bit so you can pause and, uh, okay, are we ready? Yeah, I think we're good. You know what I noticed? This one actually has two AB questions. So this practice might've been a little longer than actually what they're gonna encounter on the AP. But as you said, more practice is better. Right, exactly. So here we go. Um, so we have uh, question one, which is the subjunctive use of asset, and hopefully you came up with a result clause because you saw one of those intensifying words um, in the main clause. What did Caesar's men not know about? Well, the answer here is the tides, and you can see that um, this is a reading comprehension question. Name one and only one type of ship mentioned here, another reading comprehension question, and that could be the warships or the transport ships. And this question actually is asking for your Latin evidence so that you don't just have to say it, but you have to know which words to refer to. And you should be very specific on those words. You should not give like a whole sentence. Um, it's important for you to let the person who's reading your test, who's grading your test, to know that you know exactly what's going on here. So you would just say longas naves for the warships or onerarias for the transport ships. You can put naves in there too if you want to. Uh, what is the form of auxiliandi? Well, it is a genitive gerund, but if you see the word form, it's probably going to be um, asking not for every little bit of grammar, but for that big dominant idea. When you see auxiliandi with that ND, you should think of, of the word gerund and not just think about genitive, singular, um, if it's gerund, it's neuter, all of that stuff. So gerund would be the most important bit here. Uh, for five, it's a two-parter. Uh, translate com pluribus nauibus fractis. There's your ablative absolute um, with many ships destroyed and it identifies its case. So you don't even have to say that it's an ablative absolute. You could just have said ablative. You don't have to say that it's plural. Just, just answer the question, ablative. Here's a, in number six, the translate in context totius exercitus. So when it says translate in context, that means that you should translate it according to its grammar. Um, the in context is really to remind you that you might wanna put words in front of genitives or datives or ablatives. If it's a verb, you'll wanna give it subject, things like that. Make sure that its tense is correct. You don't have to translate the whole phrase around it. You just need to translate those two words there. And so since this is in the genitive case, you would translate it as of the whole army. And if you don't show that it's genitive, then you're not translating it in context. So make sure that you put that up there. And then finally, we have our uh, uh, culture question. This is a history question, not an English reading question. Which legate defected from Caesar after he crossed the Rubicon and joined Pompey? And this is uh, Caesar's um, trusty right-hand man in Gaul, uh, Titus Labienus. So that is something that you might've picked up when maybe when you were preparing um, your, uh, your Caesar, getting some background stuff for after you've read the Gallic War, maybe just kind of seeing what happens to Julius Caesar um, in, uh, in the rest of his life as he becomes dictator for life and his eventual uh, assassination in 44 BC on the Ides of March. All right, so Ben, I think you asked yesterday, what's better than one practice translation, it was two. And so what's better than one practice short answer? We're going to do another one. Um, so we'll go ahead and um, give you that pause button cue that um, 
I'm sure you're going to be able to see through and we'll pause just a minute to give you a chance to really stop and um, go through these questions and and these questions because we've just got one a b um, I think are probably exactly the type of length you might expect on a short answer section. Okay, that was a lot of hard work right there for them. So yeah. let's go to the answers. Yeah, so all right, so let's go ahead and go over these answers. Um, number one, give the case and use of per torbatis, that participle plus nostris, both words in the ablative. Hopefully that's setting off all kinds of bells in our head. That's an ablative absolute. We've really practiced those today. So um, I know y'all are gonna do great when you see that one on the exam. Um, then translate it with our men disturbed, with our men having been disturbed, because our men were disturbed. Um, I think even we could say because our men were perturbed. Right, Ben? That's that's one of those nice, easy English derivatives that, like, I don't know what perturbatis means, but there's a word perturbed in English. I've heard of it before, so let's just try our best. Yeah. And you get it right, too. That's, that's the neat thing. I know. Even better. Even better, right? So, number two, when did Caesar bring help in line two? Tempore opportunissimo, I think, is in there at the most opportune, the most appropriate time. Um, but fit, as I say to my kids, as happens with Caesar. Um, number three, name one and only one thing. You're going to see that prompt uh, in lines four and five that Caesar thinks it's not the right time for. And um, you all, I just want to emphasize, it's really not going to help you to write more than one thing because they're going to grade the first one you write. So just think carefully about the first one you write. Make sure it's the one you want to be scored. So you could say um, it's not the right time for attacking the enemy or for engaging in battle, both are in there. And those one and only one thing questions usually do have an option. So pick the thing you feel most confident about. Number four, translate in castra legiones reduxit. So here we've got four words to translate, but they really could give you just in castra or legiones reduxit as you know separate um, items. So on this one, we wanna say he led his legions, legiones, back. The re on reduxit means back, just like the re on um, most verbs is gonna mean back. Um, in castra, into the camp or to camp. Both of those will work. Number five, the tense of discesserunt. I see those e is to it, emus is disserunt, perfect tense endings, and that's what it is. Number six, what prevented the men from fighting at the end of the passage? a storm for Caesar. He just had terrible weather in Britain. So this is another storm. Um, and then the smallest unit of a legion that contains 60 to 100 men, that 100 is a big clue, Kentum, that we are dealing with a century. Okay, so quid nunc sciamas. And what should we know now? Well, we know now that a century has 60 to 100 men in it. And we also know about Caesar's invasion of Britannia. So we spent some time looking at the Latin for Gallic War Book 4, 24 to that first sentence in uh, chapter 36 in Latin. And hopefully we also saw how you could sail through the short answer section on the AP exam a little bit better maybe than some of Caesar's ships um, on their way to Britannia. And then we saw different types of short answer questions that you might see uh, on the AP exam. Here's verse in Jeterix, Grautias Wobis Ago, he says, Thank you all. I'm sure he's very grateful for being allowed to, to join us here today and to help you through um, this nice review video on book four. And just to let you know, uh, if you were on the, uh, if you saw the review video yesterday, you know about the AP Latin resource folder. Uh, it's at tinyurl.com slash AP Latin 2022 review. There's lots of great stuff in there that you can use to help you prepare for the AP test, maybe review some of the stuff and also practice um, just getting better at Latin. So I'd like to thank you all for joining us. Gratias, Wobis. Jenny. Gratias, Walete, Womnes. We will look forward to seeing you tomorrow. <laughs>